Yeah, I also have the tough task of changing the topic up a little bit. So we're going still for a bound state QED, but I'm now talking about chief vector measurements. So we basically want to measure on how magnetic the bound electron is. So we're working with ions and we're performing measurements of um, bound electrons and working with ions there. And since we have quite a different setup to what has been discussed before, I want to show you what we're working with in general um, as an introduction. So the alpha trap setup located at the MPIK in Heidelberg basically is a two-story setup where we have this um, room temperature beam line on the upper story. This is basically um, a high vacuum setup where we have access to multiple different ion sources. So we have access to um, what few of Jose Crespo's EBITs to produce highly charged ions. We have a laser ion source, and all of them can be produced up here, um, depending what we want to work with. And we transport them through our beamline towards the main section of the experiment, which is housed in the superconducting for Tesla magnet. Um, down here, everything becomes cryogenic. So we're working in a cryogenic 4 Kelvin um, vacuum, which allows us to inject the ions into our panning trap setup that I will explain in a second and store these ions um, for, with lifetimes for several months. So we're talking about a vacuum. If you put that in numbers, that's somewhere in the 10 to minus 16, 10 to minus 17 millibar range. Um, and that allows these incredible storage times, even for um, highly charged ions of, of months to, well, up to years, I guess. Um, this is made possible by this cryogenic valve in between. So you basically only open this every few months to inject your ions, put them into the trap, and then you're fine with the single ions to work with and do spectroscopy on them. Um, the actual trap that we call double trap set, uh, system, despite it being shown in three parts here, consists of these three sections, starting with the capture section. This is the last stage where the ions that come in are slowed down, just electrically pulsed, and we can capture and store them here. We keep some reserves in case any student uh, loses their ions and needs to reload without opening. So we don't actually have to connect to the room temperature part every time we want to reload. We have like uh, a storage cloud always in here. Um, the center part is the most critical one. That's the precision trap. That's where all the spectroscopy happens that we want to do. And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, this basically is characterized by very homogeneous fields, um, most importantly the B field, but also the electric fields that um, are applied for storing the uh, ions that we work with can be tuned very nicely due to the design of those, uh, all of those electrodes that you see here. Um, the final part, I will not go into too much detail. Uh, it has basically two tasks for the purpose of this talk. Otherwise, you can just consider it as a black box. Um, we can determine the spin state. So if you put um, something with a magnetic moment in the magnetic field, the spin will align either parallel or anti-parallel with the magnetic field. And we can use this trap to determine which orientation the spin is. The second part that I will specifically use that for is to, um, in the end, uh, separate the ions again, since I want to work with coupled ions um, that I'm going to explain to you in the upcoming slides. So just remember this as determining the orientation of the spin state and to be able to use it to separate ions once they are coupled again. Um, how does the panning trap actually work? So I've already mentioned the magnetic field. If you put a charged particle in a magnetic field, you get a cyclotron motion. I guess you're all familiar with that. Um, that gives you your radial confinement within a trap. The second part of the confinement along the axial direction is done via applying um, electric voltages on these electrodes, which gives you then also an axial oscillation for a trap particle. The combination of electric and magnetic field leads to this third motion, the magnetron motion or E cross B drift. And you get a motion that looks rather complicated, but is actually well controlled and characterized. Um, the free space cyclotron frequency that we want to know with, because it has the direct relation to the magnetic field, just, uh, just the charge over mass times the magnetic field, is then related by the quadratic sum of the three individual frequencies here. Um, I'm already giving a table uh, overview for what I want to work with, and I'll just explain to you why this is important here. In the end, we're going to work with these two um, isotopes, so two neon isotopes in the same charge states with a mass difference of uh, the 10% that you see here. And the frequencies that we get at the same voltage, um, we can basically choose the axial frequency. If we set that for one, the other is different by about 30 kilohertz here, because you have the scaling for the axial frequency by the applied voltage U on the ring. Um, some trap parameters, the C2 and the D, which are not important here. Um, and you have the behavior with the square root of the charge to mass ratio. The cyclotron frequency omega plus or omega C, they are actually very close or very similar. So they scale directly linear with the charge of a mass ratio. Um, that's why you see the 10% difference. 
with the 25 megahertz at four Tesla and at this um, roughly Q over M one half, we're working with 25 megahertz, you get two and a half megahertz frequency difference. The last one, the magnetron, um, you already see it here, it's basically identical. So it doesn't scale at all with the charge over mass ratio. It only depends on the applied voltage. If we don't change that, the ion frequencies are basically um, identical or only very tiny difference. I'm already showing you the third one, the lama frequency that you probably also have heard about. If you have the magnetic moment in the magnetic field, you get the energy splitting between spin up or spin down by H times the lama frequency. Or you can also just imagine that as the lama precession, so the spin processing around the magnetic field, if it's not perfectly aligned with the magnetic field. Um, the lama frequency is then in the end what relates us to the magnetic moment of the electron that we want to work with. How do we measure these frequencies? Oh, okay. Summary again. Um, yes, so in the end, we need to measure these two frequencies at the same time. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, we can measure these motional frequencies in the beginning um, by detecting the induced image current. So you have a moving particle in, an in a trap that's roughly around a centimeter uh, in size here. You have a particle in there. And just the tiny currents that are induced by the motion of the ion can be amplified by this resonating circuit and then an amplifier. And if you put um, a Fourier transformation to that, you get a signal that looks like, looks like that or an actual experimental data like this. Um, the actual signal is um, quite simple to understand. So what you have, the outlying shape here, is just the excitation of a resonating circuit. I guess you have all seen that. And it's excited by the residual thermal noise despite being at four Kelvin. The excitation that you still have there gives you this resonance curve. The ion basically shorts this thermal noise and gives you this dip signal in the center. So at the emotional frequency of the ion, we get this, um, what we call a dip, and we can immediately read out the frequency from fitting this line shape. What we need to get um, to, to get to the G factor is now a combination of lama and cyclotron frequency. The cyclotron frequency we basically determine by getting all these motional frequencies um, and getting this. And in a sense, that's our magnetometer to determine the magnetic field. So we're actually most, we want to determine this G factor. So we need to get rid of the magnetic field as that would be otherwise just a killer. You have a direct scaling with that. So this needs to be measured at the same time. If we combine these two equations and we get the Lamo and cyclotron frequency at the same time, you're left with an equation that looks like that. You only need to measure a frequency ratio and we need an independent input par um, parameters of electron mass and ion mass to get to that. The Lamo frequency um, we can determine by now actually using this black box that I've described in the beginning, basically the AT where we can um, discriminate between the two spin states. So you can change if the um, spin is aligned in the, uh, with the magnetic field or anti-magnetic field. If you shine in the Lamo frequency and actually hit this transition, it will change. It will not change by any other means. So it's basically ultra long lived. It will not change by itself. And you can read that out and use that to determine if you have irradiated the correct Lama frequency. Um, if we take a closer look at that formula, you also see that if there's any other means like theoreticians that calculate the G factor for us, you can not only compare to their results by doing the measurement, but you can also turn this equation around. That has been done and has been for many years the most precise determination of the electron mass. <coughs> so you simply solve this equation for the electron mass. Um, or you use it to determine the ion masses. I've also done that during my PhD thesis, um, where you take that as an input parameter instead. Um, for this pro, uh, talk, um, however, I want to talk about a difference of G factor. So we're not interested um, anymore in measuring absolute values and comparing directly to theory, but we want to now measure differences, specifically this isotope shift that I've already um, briefly mentioned. Why do we want to do that? Um, if we look at the G factor, now coming fully from theory, so this is the theoretical calculations, um, they have an identical uncertainty, and that's basically because the uncertainty comes from two loop contributions to QED. This is identical and does not depend on the uh, neutron number. So if you only change to a different isotope, the QED effects that are the limiting factor for the uncertainty, they are identical. And if you take then the difference, you can just assume that they still are identical and completely cancel out. So what is left in this difference? Um, I'm starting with the nuclear size that changes because you have added two extra neutrons. If your nuclear size or the charge distribution changes, the electron is affected by that. And that is important because it gives us the limiting uncertainty. I'm only putting this one with an uncertainty here because all other um, calculations here are precise to the given digits. And that's the only limiting factor at this level to 
determine such a difference. Now there's two interesting contributions, the recoil contribution, which basically gives you um, the relation, you have the electron bound to a nucleus, you first solve that in a fixed potential, keep the nucleus non-moving, and then now you have a finite mass, you have to consider that, and the interaction gives you this recoil effect. Since you have changed the masses, obviously that's the most critical part that changes in your system, and that gives you the main difference. <laughs> this recoil contribution now has a second part that we are very interested here. Um, that's the QED contribution to the recoil. Basically, you have an interaction now between um, the electron and the nucleus, but in quantum electrodynamics, you don't consider this as a continuous exchange, but it's discretized. So you have an exchange of discrete photons. And if you take these corrections into account, you get this, what we call QD contribution to the recoil. And that is a contribution uh, due to its size and actually being much smaller than the typical uncertainty on the absolute values. This could never be resolved and has not been directly tested yet. So um, if we manage to get the precision of such a difference to similar um, precision as the theory, we have about a four sigma headroom here to see this contribution for the very first time. So we want to set up a direct difference measurement of these g-factors. How do we do that? Well, the first step is we still have our magnetic field and we would need to know that very precisely. That's not really easily possible. So the idea is to get the ions close together and measure in the same field. That's where the coupled ions come in. This has already been done almost 20 years back with a similar purpose in mind. You cancel out the residual fluctuations of your magnetic field. If you put your ions very close together, they obviously should see the same fluctuations. Um, this has been used to perform mass comparisons um, with very nice results at the time. We are not interested though in the emotional frequencies anymore, but only at what the electron sees to get to the Lama frequency. So I can even get them closer together um, as they did. And the critical point is that if you put them now close together due to the similarity in the magnetron frequencies and the large discrepancy in the other frequencies, what you actually get is a magnetron ion crystal. So the ions will phase lock and move together on a common magnetron orbit where the phase difference between the two ions is identical and they basically should see the completely um, identical magnetic field. How do we do that? Well, we first have to start with determining the spin states. We again have used the AT. We determine and prepare both ions deterministically in a known spin state. The next step is to couple them. Um, and that's actually, it sounds rather easy, easy. That's where I spent almost two years of my PhD time on. This is really tough to get them under control and to get that all working deterministically and not kill your ions doing that. But still, um, in the end, it has worked. And we put them together in a common potential. So in the same electrode and the same electric potential, the rest, they basically first start doing by themselves. And then you have to start manipulating them. Um, after you've cooled one of the motions, the axial one down, you're already in a magnetron crystal that is now described by a common mode, basically. So the magnetron motion of the uh, former individual ions now is a coupled mode and can be described by a common mode, which is basically the center of mass motion. So the center of mass moves around the trap center and you have a separation distance that is now fixed and phase locked. So they will always be 180 degrees from each other and rotate around each other on that part or around the center of mass while the center of mass moves around the trap center. That's not favorable yet. Um, what we wanna have in the ideal case is to get the center of mass into the trap center. So I have to cool this common motion away and get the center of mass exactly into the center of trap that reduces systematic effects. Um, there's already a method that they have used in this paper that I've briefly shown to get your common mode um, to the separation mode. So what you basically do is you have a method to couple these modes together and you can deterministically um, drive your angular momentum that you have in the common mode into the separation mode. So you see separation mode going up and the common mode will go down. The final step is then to directly touch the separation mode and we can cool that to um, the distance that we like. This distance um, is not arbitrarily chosen. You have to basically take into account what happens if you put them too far from each other. The residual gradients that you still have in your magnetic field cause differences in the motion and in the magnetic field they see. If you put them too close together, they start seeing each other very strongly and all your motions get really perturbed and it's hard to detect the ions. So depending on masses and charges, um, and obviously your experimental parameters like residual gradients, the ideal distance has to be calculated and chosen in a way where you have, trade, have a trade-off between all of those um, ideas. 
Um, this has been managed and completely automized. So what I actually have to do is to couple them automatically. My script runs through and managed to prepare this motion um, by measuring everything and getting them well controlled into this final state. The next step is then the actual measurement sequence. And here it gets a little bit more technical. I'm trying to get you through this part and showing you what's actually happening. here. So what we do is a rather simple sequence. It's a Ramsey type sequence. We start with a pi half pulse in evolution time in the order of a few hundred milliseconds to seconds, um, and then a second pi half pulse. Um, I'm trying to show this on a block sphere in the co-rotating frame. So we are now sitting in a co-rotating frame at the mean lambda frequency of those two um, electron spins. So one of the particles is going, or one of the spins would going in one way, the other in the other way, since we're in the co-rotating frame in the center of both of them. If we assume simply that we have prepared both spins in the initial frame in the spin down state, so pointing downwards on this axis, and we irradiated our first pi half pulse, um, I'm characterizing that with a pi half pulse, I simply mean the rotation to the equatorial plane. Again, we're sitting the co-rotating frame at the mean lambda frequency. That's why one is slightly off to the left, the other already to the right. That is the residual rotation that you have in this frame due to the frequency sitting in the center. The next step is the evolution time, and you let both spins freely process. And that is the critical part of, the, of this um, idea. What you get now is a phase difference between the spins that is directly connected to your evolution time. So you already have an observable a phase difference between spins that is directly related to this lambda frequency difference that we are interested in the end to get to the chief factor difference. The final question is now, how do we get this phase difference mapped into a signal that we can interpret in the lab? And that's where the second pulse comes in. So depending on the phase difference of those spins at the time of the second pulse, they will behave differently. If the two spins are exactly in phase, the drive will affect them identically and the spins behave identical. If they would be opposite from each other, so with a phase difference of 180 degree, one would flip up, the other would flip down, they would behave opposite from each other. And that is the final signal that we wanna um, observe. So the coincidental behavior, so to say, of the spins. Um, after you have done this second pulse, to get to these spins, we first have to separate the ions again. This is um, already possible deterministically. So we use our AT again as a setup for that, and we can split them again, use the AT and determine the spins for both ions individually. And finally, we can look at this coincidental behavior after knowing the spins. And you see this type of modulation, where the modulation is directly the lama frequency difference scaling with the evolution time. So for slightly different evolution times, you get this frequency difference, which is I have shown already in the order of about one kilohertz. Um, I've performed such a measurement now for um, very different evolution times to basically map the difference frequency of a large range from a few hundred milliseconds to up to 2.2 seconds. And we have seen perfect coherence for all of those times that I've used here. So the full expected signal, which is a modulation of plus minus 25%, we lose some of the information that would be in there because the microwave drive gets, gets is random with respect to the spins, but that's a little bit more technical. So the expected full amplitude that we can have here is plus minus 25%, and all the measurements are within one sigma in accordance to that. So we have the full coherence up to 2.2 seconds for two quantum states, which other, uh, would in independently go with 112 gigahertz and basically lose coherence already after a few milliseconds. So it's a gain of already quite significant here to go from milliseconds coherence times to multiple seconds. In the end, you get directly from this modulation, the lama frequency difference. And um, since the paper is not quite out yet, we have just been accepted three weeks ago. Um, I only showing that we are in perfect agreement at the five times to the minus 12 level that theory has predicted, um, which is then the direct confirmation that, confirmation that the QED recoil contribution um, is correct and has been correctly calculated. So we have managed to observe this for the very first time and confirm it. The second part, I've already shown that we are limited basically by the charge radius difference or the finite size. So what that means, instead of doing the test for the QD recoil contribution, we can apply this result and instead improve the charge radius difference by about of one order of magnitude compared to the best literature values with the same result. Um, finally, what we have done is to take this calculation of the difference and apply it to set limits on new physics. So what you assume here is that there are 
could be a new mediator boson um, in a U cover type potential that would couple your electrons to neutrons. You have changed the neutron number. So if there would be any effect that the electrons actually do see the neutrons, they would typically not expect. You would get an additional influence on the G factor, on the G factor difference. And since we are in perfect agreement with theory, you can basically apply this and set limits on how large such an interaction, the interaction YE coupling to electrons, YN decoupling to neutrons versus the range or the mass of such a boson would be. Um, our limits are typically uh, are currently sitting um, here. We only get competitive in the higher mass range for now. There's already a proposal um, for a similar measurement on argon. And there's another proposal that has been come out just two months ago from uh, Vincent de Bier, that is also co author on the other paper that we are providing, where he takes additional ground state energy measurements of the electron to further suppress the uncertainty of the charge radii and improve the limits that we could set. In the ideal case for an oxygen seven measurement, where you would need the ground state energy to much higher precision than currently available, and you perform the same measurement, we could co get competitive on these bounds for new physics um, at the current level. Um, so as a summary, what I've shown you here is that we have performed the first direct comparison of G factors by measuring a Lama frequency difference coherently. Um, we have shown this coherence of these quantum states for multiple seconds on our trap so that these spins stay coherent with each other. Um, and the QED contribution, the main two loop QED contributions are not limiting anymore, but we are limited by charge radii. Turned around, that means for any system where such a measurement is possible, and you should feel free to contact me, we would now be able to determine charge radius differences very precisely with a similar measurement. Um, Second part is that we have shown an improvement for a comparison of G factors by about two orders of magnitude compared to measuring the absolute values and then comparing them. So this offers you a great tool to basically compare such measurements um, and set further bounds on um, potential fifth force in the future. Finally, and the right guy sitting here in the audience with us, uh, such a comparison should in principle be possible with matter and antimatter comparison, uh, more precisely what Stefan has already done with the antiproton to H minus, and you could couple those ions directly with each other. In principle, measure this tool and get the most precise comparison between matter and antimatter G factors coherently in the trap. That's also what I wanted to end with, and thank you. You can find our experiment also in such a review paper as has been shown before. Um, you should look at that if you want any more technical information to the experiment. Um, we can uh, happily talk about that with you. Thank you. Thank you, team. For your work. What I find very surprising that now we have a method to determine the difference, not of the charge rate, but of square of the charge rate, because yes, um, but for all the uh, all the stable elements. Well, it's a little bit more technical than that. The G factors have to match up, and they will not cancel if you take two completely different um, isotopes. But yes, in principle, you can get differences from that. Uh, but I mean, um, so I need isotope, isotope difference. Uh, isotope di uh, differs yes. only by the differ only by the number of neutrons. So yes, if you, if you have hydrogen, the G factor is very close. Yes, but the QD contributions still need to cancel. So I need theoreticians to be sure enough that for the different isotope pairs that you choose, the QD contributions actually are the same or cancel yes, good same enough. Same, same, because the QD yes. depends on charge. So if the yes. charge is the same. Sure. Yeah, this, I would say this is very amazing. Then. Uh, at the beginning, we use it for the determination of electron mass because this is the best, as we mentioned, best determination yes. of electron mass. I mean, the, the most likely reason. Yes. And now it looks you are able, maybe to, I don't know, maybe not for a very heavy, but for all the elements, now you can determine the charge radius difference. Yes, it's just a long I measurement, so it depends on what is interesting to people. Wow, this is, I would say, I find it very amazing. Dandor. I think this goes back to Arch Harlow saying never measure anything but frequencies, right? Yes. <laughs> Um, on your, one of your last slides with respect to the new physics. So first, great talk and fa fa fantastic results. I'm really super happy to see that. Um, you, you showed this hydrogen 1 is 2 is isotope shift as a limit yes. on new physics. Can you, can you elaborate a bit, a bit on this, how this comes about? Um, so I'm not an expert in that, but um, what you basically take is that there's a calculation going in there to, to get the frequency calculation. And there have been groups using these um, comparison to theory and the agreement with the experiment to simply set these limits on how strong an interaction between um, electron and neutron is. So to get a cup into this. Independent. 
maybe if, uh, Dima Budka. Yeah, I just sorry. actually had wanted to ask whether, <clears throat> thank you for the great talk. I just wanted to ask whether you may be sensitive to spin dependent interactions as well. Um, there are ideas on that, but I'm not sure if we would have the sensitivity with these measurements at the current level. He measures the um, interaction of spin. So it, 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 it's directly spin dependent interaction. Is it? Yeah, because this is the well, measurement of the spin flip. But the in, the, in, the of the of, in the field of um, electron, with the, in the field of nuclear and magnetic, so it's a spin dependent force. He's, he's sensitive, to spin dependent, but, but, but not on but, velocity dependent, but the direct. Spin but your your potential that you you have limited, right? This you said it's Yukawa type. Is it? Does yes. it have spins in it? No, this one doesn't. No. So see, the Yukawa type potential here does not yet. <laughs> I'm confused. For the questions. <laughs> Ah. Great talk, Tim, <clears throat> and really elegant experiment. I, I have one question, more, more technical question, mm -hmm. like the separation of the two particles from the coupled state. Are you doing this in the magnetic bottle with different cyclotron orbits or something like that? I'm prepared for that question, I think. So. Yes, what do you do? And that is a little bit more technical, sorry for the rest. So you have a quadratic contribution to the magnetic field, what we call a D2 or a magnetic bottle. And what I use is a cyclotron excitation for one of the ions. So I destroy my magnetron crystal. I put one of the ions on a large cyclotron radius so that it gets an ion magnetic moment. It's now moving on a fast cyclotron mode with a large radius. And then you get an additional axial force because of your D2, same as for the spins. And I'm plotting here the effective potential for one of the ions being at such a large cyclotron radius, so almost a millimeter. Um, and you see that the potential now combined from electric and magnetic potential looks different. And you can simply use to basically wiggle one into the trap while the other gets reflected by your B2 gradient and out of the trap. And this works deterministically well, almost 600 attempts without fail. So I can really determine which of the ions I want to excite and get reflected and while the other goes into the trap. Um, so going back to your uh, the picture of the uh, block sphere where you showed the time of evolution, um, I was actually not understanding how come your two spin states overlap at the end or so. Oh, this is random. So basically, if they overlap or not, I just choose by the evolution time. So it all depends on the evolution time. And what's missing out in this representation, because it's, it's really hard to show in an animation, is that you still have your magnetic field um, chitter. So the magnetic field changes. And that means basically my drive will not be at the same position for the second drive. And that is also the information that I lose in the modulation. So I apply a microwave drive to get a rotation once. And the second one, a few seconds later, will not be at the same phase. And that's what I'm kind of neglecting here to make the picture a little bit simpler and follow just the spins. But wouldn't be also, the, the, the also be at the end split by the Larmor, uh, the, um, the Larmor frequency of the, of the two spin states? Yeah, that's the phase difference that we measure. That's actually what I'm going for. The phase difference will change by the evolution time times the lambda frequency difference. That's the modulation signal that we are after, actually, which is why antiproton versus H minus would be perfect if we get someone to calculate the shielding for the H minus precisely enough, such, such that this comparison becomes possible. Because then you again have a lambda frequency difference. The shielding makes the um, proton G factor then different again from the antiproton for H minus comparison, and then you still have such a difference measurement. And your results will be published when? Um, so the acceptance in Nature came three weeks ago, and we're waiting for the proofs right now. I can't tell you how quick they will be. But it, um, it means very soon. Yes, it's also already on the archive, the first version of the paper, um, for two weeks now. But you should find it in the upcoming weeks. Yeah, I noticed. I, we noticed such a paper. <laughs> Further questions? It, oh, there is uh, Grzegorz at the end. Uh, uh. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering why you're using highly charged uh, atoms instead of just a single charged atom of some other kind? Is it a trapping issue? Um, not necessarily, no. You could perform that for any charge state in principle. That's just what our experiment is um, designed for and optimized for right now. Let me answer. 
a theory, it, it, it means you cannot perform such accurate theory for single charge ions. I understand, but why but, use? But, well, multi-electron single ones, but we could yeah. still use some light ions to do exactly. the same kind of yeah, measurements. That's the 